In the desert of the American Southwest, a lone rider receives an unmistakable warning. From a creature that could kill him in moments. But between that sinister rattle and the deadly bite at the other end lies an amazing reptile. From coast to coast, rattlesnakes, many of them beautifully marked, have inched their way into the Americas and into our lives. Rattlesnakes belong to the viper family. There are more than 30 species, and they live all the way from southern Canada right down through Mexico and beyond. A few even thrive on remote islands. But one thing unites them all, the most chilling sound in nature, the rattle. Fossils show that rattlesnakes evolved only five million years ago, not long after we did. They had to adapt to the vast open spaces of the Americas. Large animals could easily trample on them, and so rattlesnakes needed a clear warning. This is no false alarm. Venom can serve as a backup if need be. In the deserts of the Southwest, the only shelter is in the ancient rocks that scar the horizon. The sun's rays beat hardest on south-facing slopes, warming the crevices beneath. In winter, the rattlesnakes move in. Inside these dens, hundreds of them may end up in a tangle together. The odd non-rattler, such as this harmless garter snake, rubs flanks with venomous rattlers. One of them is a young female western diamondback. This is her story. She has been alone all year, but this is one of the few times that she will tolerate the company of others. This den was empty before the winter, but some rattlesnakes squat in homes that are already occupied. There are no rocky crypts here, in the vast belts of grassland that slice down America. Prairie rattlesnakes must therefore be more resourceful in their search for a winter den. Their solution is ingenious. They let prairie dogs do all the hard work. Beneath the flat surface lies a labyrinth of tunnels and dens, perfect for rattlesnakes. Once in, the snakes, who got there first, are impossible to get rid of. By the time the snakes leave, the prairie dogs will no longer need the burrows as winter shelter.
The prairie dog can't get home through its own front door. When they come above ground to feed, the prairie dogs have to keep a constant eye out for predators. One of them, spotting danger, gives the alarm. A great horned eagle owl. Time to find a bolt hole, fast. Another enterprising rattlesnake also gets its den built for it by fire. After the last flames have flickered out, many trees are left blackened and hollow. Where roots once invaded the soil, stump holes now house the largest rattlesnake of all, the magnificent eastern diamondback. Such fires create new homes for the survivors and promote new growth for the forest. But they also exact a cost. Winter is over, and the eastern diamondback leaves its shelter to travel the long distance to summer feeding grounds. Its elaborate markings help camouflage its two-meter body. Back in the deserts of the southwest, spring has coaxed out the flowers. The warmth that seeps into the den gently rouses the rattlesnakes. First out is the female diamondback. Her last meal was six months ago, just before she went into hibernation. Her energy is ticking away fast. Food is now a priority. Still sluggish, she, like all reptiles, needs heat to get going. She must be back in top shape by dusk if she is to stand any chance of a meal. Back in the east, a rattlesnake already warmed up lives in the woody corridors between strips of wild cane. Well disguised among the dappled light and leaf litter lurks the canebrake. Here, 
the snake's ground-level world becomes more complex. There's another dimension to account for. Height. But leaves and shadows don't slither like that. The squirrel spots a suspicious ripple and with a flick of the tail tells the snake that it has been seen. The cane brake will just have to wait, motionless, for a less vigilant squirrel. Squirrels would be way too big for many snakes to handle. Here, up in the loose, steep rock slides of the mountains of Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, lives a rattlesnake that is barely a foot long. The tiny, ridge-nosed rattlesnake. subtly colored to blend into the background. It preys on animals such as small rock lizards. The ridge nose's narrow, arrow-shaped head lets it squeeze after its prey through even the tightest gaps. But so much about these tiny mountain snakes is still a mystery, partly because they live in such isolated, inaccessible places. Back in the western desert, the Diamondback needs a burst of solar power to recharge her batteries. By the time it's dark, her power levels have risen and she is ready for action. Ready for her first unsuspecting prey, which should be out and about at any moment now. Heat radiating from the ground will keep her going in the early hours of the night. She wastes no time. By smelling the air with her forked tongue, she soon picks up the scent trail of a wood rat. It signposts the way as clearly as a map, straight to the wood rat's nest. The diamondback can detect heat and the rat's body stands out like a beacon. Two pits at the front of her head focus heat onto a grid of thousands of nerves. These, together with two more organs in her mouth, help build a perfect heat image. The rat stalked by such a sophisticated system of sight, smell, and heat, is in serious trouble. A spaghetti junction of old, stale animal tracks crisscrosses the ground. 
but by using her forked tongue to compare smells, the diamondback easily picks out the rat's fresh trail. As night cools the air, the rat still shimmers with heat. The snake can detect even the slightest change in temperature. She takes aim. single stab with her fangs, which are like hinged hypodermic needles, is all it takes. The rat staggers away, mortally wounded. It will do its dying well away from the diamondback, who thus avoids injury from her struggling victim's teeth or claws. Venom is an ingenious, long-distance chemical weapon. Not only is the rat already dead by the time the snake finds it, but it is also half digested. Venom, which is made from modified saliva, is a rich cocktail of proteins and enzymes that breaks down flesh. The diamondback unlocks her jawbones to squeeze the corpse into her throat, head first, so that its legs don't get stuck. Her fangs help fork it in. With her mouth so full, she can neither get away from danger nor bite in self-defense, and must, for a while, depend on her rattle's reputation alone. Muscular contractions pass the rat onto her stomach. It's the human equivalent of gulping down a 200-pound hamburger. A special tube poking from the base of her mouth, the glottis, allows her to breathe in mid-swallow. Then, Hooking her jawbones back together with a little yawn, she sits back to digest. Not a whisker, not a drop of blood is wasted. It's an extremely efficient way to feed. Back on the east coast, there's a barrier in the middle of the eastern diamondback's migration path. Fortunately, like many snakes, it is a superb swimmer. So good, in fact, that eastern diamondbacks have been found several miles out to sea. Because it doesn't hunt while swimming, this snake, though deadly on land, is harmless in water.
it pushes against the water in the same way as it does against the ground. Dry land isn't necessarily any easier to crawl on. Loose surfaces such as sand make it difficult for a large snake to get a good grip. It's a locomotion problem also faced and solved by the sidewinder rattlesnake. In the deserts of the southwest in Mexico, the sidewinder throws itself in liquid loops across the scorching sand. It's so hot here that only a few minutes out of the shade could kill it. Life for a snake is a never-ending thermal balancing act. Rattlesnakes get most of the water they need from their prey, but the chance to drink is always welcome. as well as daily problems of temperature and dehydration, rattlesnakes also have to contend with predators of their own. The diamondback, not nimble at the best of times, is still stuffed full of wood rat and is particularly vulnerable. And she's being eyed up by the fastest bird in the West a roadrunner. And roadrunners, which belong to the cuckoo family, eat small snakes. To kill, the roadrunner would have to deliver a powerful blow to the snake's head with its drill-like beak. Luckily for the diamondback, she's too big. The bird won't risk it. But sometimes there is no risk to the predator. The non-venomous common king snake appears to be immune to rattlesnake venom. Its aim is to coil around the diamondback and swallow her alive. Twisting up to make herself look bigger, the diamondback, once she recognizes her attacker, drops the rattle. The king snake, like all snakes, is deaf and cannot hear the beat from the diamondback's personal percussion instrument, so there's no point in playing it. If the diamondback can avoid being grabbed by the head for long enough, the king snake may well tire.
For those that can hear it, the rattle is one of the most effective defenses in nature, giving fair warning in plenty of time. If it is heated, no one gets hurt, and the snake doesn't waste any venom. If it is ignored, by a peccary, for example, the snake will bite, though often without injecting venom, which it saves for its prey. The rattle, powered by muscle similar to heart muscle, uses very little energy, and so can keep going for a long time. It says a lot about the snake's physical condition, useful information for a ground squirrel. The faster the rattle, the warmer and therefore the more dangerous the snake. Taking a calculated risk, the squirrel launches into an intimidating display. But the threat is minor compared to dangers from man. The city of Phoenix is surrounded by knuckles of high rock, home to isolated rattlesnake populations. These snakes are effectively stranded high and dry. Evicted from the land below, snakes such as this tiger rattlesnake can no longer cross over to the other side to breed. For now, these groups are hanging on, but just barely. Their future is almost certain, slow but inevitable extinction on these artificial islands. The snakes that evolved on natural islands, however, have no need to leave for they occur nowhere else. Santa Catalina in the Gulf of California has a very unusual rattlesnake. The island teems with small birds. At sunset, they fly back to roost together in the scrub trees. Just when the Santa Catalina rattlesnake is feeling lively. Most rattlesnakes have stocky builds, but this one in order to reach the birds on the thinnest branches, has an unusually slender, agile body. Even more bizarre, this rattlesnake doesn't want to give a warning so it's lost its rattle. Elsewhere, some other rattlesnakes are also evolving to lose their rattles. The diamondback has finished digesting her meal. 
Her old skin is no longer big enough. It's time for a new one. Like human skin, the top layer of snake skin is dead. Unlike humans, who shed bits of skin all the time, snakes do so neatly and dramatically. Rubbing against rough rocks helps loosen the old skin around the jaw. Because her eyelids, which will also peel off, have fused into a hard, misty scale, she feels particularly vulnerable. When the last shred of skin pulls away, it reveals a brand new dark link of rattle, nearest to the black and white stripes. The rattle is made of keratin, the same stuff as hair, claws, and fingernails. Locking together in a loose figure eight, the segments kink upwards to avoid getting snagged on the ground. The whole process of emerging, shiny and clean from an old skin, has turned the rattlesnake into a powerful spiritual symbol of new life and fertility. At the ancient Mayan temple of Chichen Itza in Mexico, the steps are bordered by gigantic stone serpents. The tropical rattlesnakes sheltering in the temples were considered sacred. The snakes the ancient Mayans honored have been immortalized. If God anoints you to pick a thing up, if it bites you, the Bible don't say it won't bite you. If it bites you, you Modern worship uses not symbols, but live snakes. A passage from the Bible urges, and thou shalt take up serpents. So in Tennessee, members of one evangelical sect do just that. Elsewhere, rattlesnakes are slaughtered in their thousands. Yearly roundups take place across the southern and southwestern states, originally organized because of exaggerated claims that rattlesnakes harmed livestock and people. Oh, 
Today, the extravaganza is commercial. The craft work of the Pueblo tribes does no harm. Snakes, and rattlesnakes in particular, continue to be of great ritual importance to the Native Americans. Representing lightning bolts, the snakes deliver prayers for rain to the spirits that control the weather. Paradoxically, female rattlesnakes, those symbols of birth, reproduce only once every two years. The diamondback had last year off. This year, she is fertile again. A male, following a trail of pheromones left by the female, seeks her out. To stimulate her, he stretches along her body, rubbing and stroking. If she is receptive, the diamondback will allow him to mate. Using one of his two reproductive organs, called hemipenes, the male transfers sperm into the female. stay entwined for several hours. Because these encounters are rare, the diamondback can store the male's sperm until she needs it. It is his only contribution to the next generation. All rattlesnakes give birth to live young, an exhausting task. The diamondback can help speed up the growth of her unborn babies by spending more time in the sun. Her young will be born at the end of the summer with the first rains. Now the rattlesnakes are at their most active.
In preparation for the birth, the diamondback seeks out shelter. After a gestation of 90 days, the unborn babies are now fully formed and ready to face the world. Muscular contractions help push them out. The thin, protective birth sacs, now their only link with their mother, are so fragile that they tear moments after the babies emerge. The little diamondbacks are independent in a matter of minutes. They even have venom, which is just as toxic as that of adult rattlesnakes. There just isn't quite as much of it. They are the spitting image of their mother, except that is for one little detail. Something is missing. Where there should be a rattle, there is at the moment just a little button. By morning, the diamondback has given birth to 10 new rattlesnakes. In a country where rodents still cause much crop damage, the young snakes are an important addition to the rat catcher workforce. They shed their skin for the first time when they are only five to 10 days old and will leave their mother soon afterwards. These young snakes will not become much of a threat to humans. We are more likely to be hit by lightning than be killed by a rattlesnake bite. And scientists are finding that venom may even help treat some human illnesses. After the skin has come away, a horny sheath at the end of the tail is left behind and becomes the first segment of the young snake's rattle. Every time the snake sloughs, several times a year, a new bit of rattle hooks on. The youngster could live for 25 years. But many rattlesnakes won't last that long. The huge eastern diamondback, for example, has just had to travel 20 miles to get back from summer feeding grounds because suitable areas closer to home have been destroyed by human development. Now, though, it has made it safely back to its familiar winter home.
Winter is also coming to the desert, and the Diamondbacks' year of hunting, mating, and breeding is drawing to a close. By following the sun's curving path across the sky in the morning and afternoon, she is able to make her own path back to the den on a straight, direct route. She has traveled several miles from the den this summer. Her young, now independent, also use scent trails to lead them to the same hibernation den that their mother uses. She, however, may not make it back. It takes some time for a slow-moving snake to creep across a 20-foot ribbon of asphalt, and the delicious warmth of the pavement makes her linger. For hundreds of rattlesnakes each year, the middle of the road is the end of the road. All around the outcrops of rock, webs of familiar scent trails guide the rattlesnakes, so solitary for much of the year, towards their spectacular annual reunion. Outside the den, early arrivals have time to catch the last of the year's sun. So when the weather turns colder, there's not far to go. Having released them in the spring, the den now draws the same snakes back to its warm, sheltered core. Like planets orbiting around a warm star, the snake's whole year revolves around this den. Without it, the diamondback and the others would perish. Inside the den, the mass of snake bodies acts like a layer of scaly insulation, retaining heat for the benefit of all. Somehow, the dens never seem to get overcrowded. Favorite dens may have been in use for hundreds of years, passed on each year to the next generation of youngsters. And as long as we can be as tolerant of them as they are of each other, Rattlesnakes should be curling up together in here for centuries to come.